Now we get into it. The plants are planted and the gardens are growing. And not only that, we've even had a few harvests. The bounty is on its way. This is where the true intricacies of growing a vegetable garden kick in and garden quickies steal the show. Here's episode 71 to 80 in case you missed one. Strawberry flowers are amazing graceful blooms that are a surprise injection of color into our gardens often before any of our other crops are even awake. But more important than their aesthetics and how they look is what they represent. That's right, berries. Bountiful, beautiful, bouncing berries. You got to admit it, the annual strawberry hall is one of the best parts of gardening. Unless, of course, it's one of those years where you don't get any berries. Nothing is more frustrating than putting in the time, effort, and space into a once-a-year crop, only to get a plethora of leaves and a dud of a harvest. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we help you get the most out of each crop. And today, we're talking strawberry production. Or more accurately, how to guarantee a berry harvest every year. There's four things that you can focus on to make that happen. Time is short as always, so let's get going. The first thing I look at when my strawberry plants aren't producing like I want them to is their age. Despite being a perennial, strawberry plants have a shelf life. Their tight clusters of crowns grow and spread, eventually competing with one another, diminishing production after around year five. On the flip side, strawberry plants normally set their fruiting buds in the fall. So in most cases, you won't see any flowers or fruit until the strawberry plant's second year. Even though the foliage is lush and the plants are huge, many new growers make this mistake with their young plants. Another issue that could affect your berry production is moisture. As a woodland berry, strawberry plants love it moist. Too dry will most certainly affect berry production and quality, but so will too wet. Poor drainage can cause root rot and be equally as harmful to your harvest, so watch those moisture levels. At number three, we have competition. Competition is a stress for most crops, but with the case of strawberries, it also comes from within. For sure, invasive competitors are going to hinder growth, as well as your harvests, but strawberry plants are also a bit self-destructive. What I mean by that is, they send out these appendages that we call runners, and these guys are a drain on the plant. Like the suckers on tomatoes, strawberry runners take energy away from the main plant. And while they're great for making mass amounts of new strawberry plants and expanding your patch, Leaving them on can cause much lower berry production. Remove those runners and watch your harvest explode. And finally, the fourth key to guaranteed strawberry production is nutrients. And this one is directly related to moisture, especially in container strawberries. Every time we water, we flush the soil of nutrients and deficient plants rarely produce well. Feed your strawberries a balanced liquid organic feed twice per year once in the early spring, and then again after your last harvest. Feed the plants so that they can feed you. Food for thought that'll hopefully tide you over till the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Strawberry plants are tough, and they put up with a lot from us as we try to get the most berries from them every year. Mismanaged watering, poor fertilizing, inclement weather, and winter itself doesn't appear to set them back permanently. In fact, even the ones completely forgotten about seem to do just fine. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we solve all your plant problems. And today is all about relocating a long lost strawberry plant. Along the south side of my garden fence, I got a string of eight foot beds that I haven't used in three years, completely letting them grow over. In and amongst that four foot high grass 
is a dynamite specimen of a strawberry plant. I believe it's Fresca, but I don't know for sure. Either way, thankfully, I just barely missed it with the weed whacker. Today, I'm gonna dig up, replant, and relocate this guy to a new home. Time short as always, so let's dive in. Or dig in, either way. Strawberries are very shallow rooted, crawling type plants. So it's easy to see why over the years, this guy just got missed. It also means that digging it up for replanting should be very easy as well. When you're digging up strawberries, yes, they have shallow minimal root systems, but you still want to keep as much of them intact as possible. I dig a halo around the main crown of the plant, about a foot in diameter. Really easy stuff, because we're only going to go down about six inches in depth. When you're digging up older strawberry plants, don't pull from the crown or stems. Get down and dirty and dig them up properly. Trust me when I say from experience, they're way too easily damaged to just be yanked up. Just work at it and you'll get it. Huzzah! Free at last. Now, sometimes when you're digging up an old strawberry plant, it might actually be more than one plant. You see, strawberries propagate themselves not only from seeds as well as runners, they also have what's called crown divisions. And this is where the main strawberry plant itself will break off into brand new strawberry plants. This is good, you want to split them apart. I'm going to transplant this guy up into a pot for two reasons. One, I don't really have any better garden space available right now. But two, I don't know what kind of strawberry this is. I have an idea, but I don't know for sure. And eventually, I want to key it out. So if it's in a pot, I can keep an eye on it. Strawberry plants need a pot volume of around five gallons to really shine. Grab a pot that's more wide than deep and some standard potting mix and you're ready to go. Whether or not your strawberry plant needs fertilizer right now is going to depend on the time of the year. Check out the link in the top right corner for how to properly fertilize your strawberries. Place the strawberry plant high up right at the existing root collar. Do not bury them. That could cause root rot and possibly kill the plant. Mulch after planting and water heavily and we've just successfully relocated an adult strawberry plant. Easy stuff. Know what else is easy stuff? Tune in for the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Beets are the best. Beautiful, bountiful, bulbous roots overflowing with nutrition and flavor. Cold hardy and tolerant of a wide range of soils and conditions also makes beets super easy to grow. Which makes this dark dreary day even worse because not only is it pouring rain, I'm not going to be getting any beets, at least not from this bed. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of the Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we get down to the bottom of things. In this case, to the bottom of my beet plants. To find out why these four foot high mega specimens of Detroit Supreme aren't gonna give me any beets this year. There's one single reason for why this is, and although it's literally never happened to me in the 12 years that I've been growing beets, it's actually not uncommon, and it was pretty easy to figure out. Time is short though, so let's dive in. To reverse detective this one, we need to go back to the beets life cycle. You see, Beets are what's known as a biennial crop. Basically, they're plants that take two years to flower, fruit, and set their seed. The first year is all about growing leaves, stems, and roots. And in the case of beets, that also means that lovely bulbous taproot that we're after. And in the second year of that life cycle, the beets produce the flowers and the seeds. But I planted these beets in September. That was only eight months ago. Why are they flowering now? Eight months isn't even a year, let alone two years. What gives? Well, you see, that answer has more to do with when I planted these guys rather than how long ago I planted them. 
It's because biennials mark the start of their second year with the onset of winter. The cold dormancy is officially the end of the first half of a biennial's life, regardless if the plant is six weeks old or six months old. That cold, vernalizing chilling period stimulates the reproductive growth in the beet's life cycle. So the beet plant's focus is to stop all root and shoot development and put all its energy into its flower buds. All energy is directed to the reproductive appendages, so there's really no more taproot formation. And if you look close, even the leaves are starting to get smaller and less lush. It doesn't matter how old the plants are in the literal sense, once winter hits, flowers are coming at the expense of the rest of the crop. Which further proves that old saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Except maybe the next episode of the Garden Quickie. I love it when it rains. Not so much for making videos, but a fresh spring rain seems to make my garden come alive. And why not? Water is a massive component that is so important to nearly every life function of our plants. But for something so vital, water is one of those things that rides the line between necessary and too much of a good thing. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the gardening basics. And today's episode is all about watering. Or more specifically, overwatering and the dangers of. I got three reasons not to do it. Time short as always, so let's get into it. Plants use water for everything. They use it for structure, growth, chemical reactions, and nutrient transport. Without enough water, your crops will die, no question. But if it's so vital, how can too much water actually harm our plants? Well, it does this in a few ways. First, it physiologically changes the plants, namely the roots. Plants get nearly all of their water by uptaking it through their roots. And they do this by the many, many root hairs that branch off from the root tips. Excess water actually kills these root hairs off, damaging the plant's ability to uptake water. So ironically, too much water actually becomes not enough. The second way that too much water is really bad for our plants is root rot and the creation of an anaerobic environment. Roots uptake water for the plants, yes, but they also need oxygen. Down in our soil profile, there's gaps between the rocks, minerals, and organic matter. These gaps are filled with an alternating ratio of air and water, ideally in a perfect balance. Too much water, however, fills in all the air gaps, suffocating the plants, causing them to suffer or even die. Further to that, the excessive soggy conditions allows for the proliferation of certain funguses. And it's these certain funguses that actually attack plant roots. So really, it's a double whammy. And finally, the third reason that excess water is so bad for your plants, particularly container plants like this strawberry here, or even your indoor house plants, is that all that watering, even with perfect drainage and aeration, is constantly washing the nutrients and organic matter out of your soil. With the soil being leached of all its goodness, all its minerals, nutrients, and organic matter, how can the plants possibly thrive? When you break it down, Gardening is all about a perfect balance of all the elements necessary for healthy plants. And it often comes back to the right application of water. And speaking of coming back, hopefully you'll come back for the next episode of the Garden Quickie. In our last Garden Quickie, we discussed all the dangers associated with overwatering our plants. Root hair damage and destruction, root rot, anaerobic conditions, and the leaching away of nutrients. Pretty damaging stuff for our plants, sometimes permanent, but it doesn't change the fact that we still need to water. Our crops still need moisture, and we need to know how much to give 
and when to give it, especially with summer coming. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the fundamentals of gardening. And today's episode is all about knowing when to water. To do that, we need to be able to tell the current moisture of our soil. I got three easy ways that we can check on that. Time short as always, so let's dive in. The question I most often get is when do I water my plants? And ironically, it's a question that can't be answered. There just isn't one single universal watering schedule. Due to differences in climate, soil types, local weather, and a zillion other factors that are unique to each of our growing situations. So the issue of when to water your plants simply comes down to when they need it. Ideally, we want to water about a day or so before the plants begin to flag or wilt. Obviously, that's not something that we can know ahead of time, so the next best way to predict when to water is to check the soil moisture. And the fastest, most simplest way to do that is the finger test. Just as it sounds, remove the mulch from the area you want to test and poke your finger down two to three inches. Basically, just above your knuckle. If the soil feels dry and your finger comes out clean, it's probably time to water. This is the simplest and most rudimentary way to test. Another way to test is the popsicle or bamboo stick method. In the same fashion, remove the mulch from the area you want to test and stick the stick down three to five inches. Leave it there for about 30 seconds, then remove slowly. Moist soil is gonna result in bits of dirt clinging to the stick, as well as the stick itself being discolored where it's come into contact with moisture. A clean, non-discolored stick means dry soil and that you should probably water sooner than later. And finally, we have a bit more of a scientific approach and that's an actual water meter. They only run about $10 online and I find them to be mostly accurate. Do ensure that the prongs are cleaned every time you use them, both for best results and for product longevity. For veggies, we're aiming for the 40 to 80% range of moisture, which will be marked by the green safe zone on the meter itself. These three methods take the guesswork out of watering, making your gardening life easier in the process. Know what else is also easy? Checking out the next episode of The Garden Quickie. Plants find unique and ingenious ways to propagate themselves, spreading and colonizing every square inch they get a chance to set up shop. Strawberry plants are the best at this, and they have a unique appendage just for this purpose. And you're probably starting to see them on your strawberry plants at home. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the plant basics. And today is all about strawberry runners. More specifically, what the heck are they? And why do strawberry plants send them out in the first place? Time short as always, so let's get into it. Strawberry runners, known scientifically as stolons, are horizontal elongated stems arising from the mother plant that terminally end in a brand new daughter plant. These daughter plants are genetically identical to the main mother plant as this is just a form of vegetative reproduction. As the runners age, adventitious roots will begin to form at the base and the plants will root themselves right in place, colonizing a new area one to two feet away from the main plant. As you can see, strawberry plants can quickly colonize a large area in this way, which when you think about it, is a pretty handy life strategy for a low crawling plant. Which leads us to why do they do this? Why do they spend the energy to propagate this way? Why not just go with the flower and seed method like all the other plants? Well, strawberries do this too, obviously. But to see why it's not always their first choice at reproduction, we must look back to where strawberries came from. You see, strawberries are naturally a woodland plant with small discrete flowers. Think about it. Living in a pretty sheltered environment, not attracting very many insects, and probably not getting much wind dispersal. Mean strawberries had to find another way. 
their life strategy of reproducing by crawling runners is actually pretty smart and possibly necessary. By producing these daughter clones, the strawberry plants can be much more successful and prolific than relying on the flower, pollination, and seed method of reproduction. Fascinating stuff. Know what else should be fascinating? Quite likely the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Although initially quite shocking, and something you never want to see as a gardener, wilting is pretty common in our plants. Non-woody plants, which is basically 99% of the crops we grow, use water instead of wood to keep themselves upright. And it's this internal water pressure that keeps the plants turgid and growing, reaching for those rays of sun. However, for as much water as plants absorb through their roots, they're losing a nearly equal amount to transpiration. And when that balance is challenged on a hot day like today, we get problems. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we help you to have the healthiest garden possible. And today, we're talking all about wilting. What is it? Why do plants do it? And can it be fixed? Wilting, also known as flagging, is an extreme life strategy by plants to conserve moisture when the rate of transpiration by the leaves exceeds that of the water intake of the roots. The plants are dehydrated. They're using up more water than they can take in, which makes wilting a physiological response. This lack of water can happen for several reasons, the most obvious being drought and extreme heat, but it can also be brought on by damaged roots, poor soil, and high salinity. Fortunately, when caught early enough, wilting is easily reversed. Solve the problem causing the moisture imbalance, in this case drought, and the plant bounces right back, looking no worse for the wear. Make no mistake, however, wilting is not ideal. It's an extreme physiological response to a lack of water. But for us growers, it's a highly useful visual indicator that our plants need something from us. It's their way of telling us that something isn't quite right. You know what is right though? Tuning in and watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. A healthy garden is teeming with life. Infinite micro and macro organisms all playing a part in the grand scheme. Beautiful and sometimes stunning, each one is more amazing than the previous. However, the real trick comes in trying to figure out which of these enigmatic creatures is good and which is not. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we break down all the intricacies of gardening. And today's episode is all about the garden centipede, friend or foe. Garden centipedes, also known as brown or stone centipedes, are segmented arthropods in the genus Lithobius. Growing up to just over an inch long in their five-year lifespan, Garden centipedes live in cool, moist, dark environments, but these guys don't dig. So to find the spots they like, they resort to living under things in your garden. Things such as pots, wood, bricks, or debris. When they are discovered though, these guys scurry for cover, being quite impressive with their evasive behaviors. But does that erratic behavior and possible frightful appearance Signal centipedes as an enemy of our garden? No, it doesn't. These guys are on our side. Centipedes are carnivores, taking down slugs, snails, aphids, and sometimes even larger beetles. And when they get bored of that, they'll even break down the organic matter in the top layers of the soil. Oh, and I almost forgot. They feed on fly larvae and other insect eggs that are laid just below the surface. Centipedes are working for us. There's no question that these guys are beneficial friends. Even though they're perennially frightened when discovered, you shouldn't be. 
Let them go on their merry way, doing the things that they do to support your garden ecosystem. No one else is going to support your garden ecosystem? Watching the next episode of The Garden Quickie. The best harvest in our gardens comes from the best plants. And getting the best plants can only happen when they're at their happiest. And that always means giving them the optimal range in which to grow. Optimal parameters of temperature, light, moisture, and nutrients. Within the right range, your crops will explode, surprising even the most veteran grower. One parameter that's often overlooked, however, is pH. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we solve all your gardening issues. And today's episode is all about finding that optimal pH range for our plants. pH is a scientific measurement scale of the relative acidity or alkalinity of a substance or solution. In this case, our soil. It uses a 14 point scale with seven being neutral, which would be something like pure water. Anything below seven is considered acidic and anything above is considered alkaline. The pH of the human body is around 7.4. Excluding acid lovers, such as these blueberries here, most of our crops need a neutral pH. There's two ranges we're concerned with though. The range in which our plants can survive, which is between 5.5 and 7.5. And then there's the optimal range, the range in which our plants thrive. And that's between six and seven. So neutral to slightly acidic is what we're after. When the pH of your soil falls outside of the optimal range, Nutrients and water get increasingly harder and harder to obtain by the plant's roots. Chemical processes in highly acidic and highly alkaline soils block this uptake and the plants suffer. Okay, so how do we measure it? Well, you can take a soil sample from your garden and send it off to a lab for analysis, but that takes time and it's not cheap. However, these inexpensive meters that you can buy online, they work just as well to give you a quick idea of how your soil is doing. Fixing an extreme pH that falls outside of the range we want almost always involves adding something to the soil. The safest two additions that I use are dolomite lime for acidic soils and elemental sulfur for alkaline ones. Always check the packaging for application rates, but err on the side of less. Drastic pH changes are often way worse than the pH problem itself. But even worse than that would be missing the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Summer gardens in full swing are a thing of beauty. Not just the colors and shapes and contrasts, but the promise of bounties that were just hopes and dreams only a few short months ago. But beauty takes work, and so does our gardening. Just because the garden is growing exponentially during this optimal time of year, doesn't mean that we don't have anything to do. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. Welcome back to another episode of The Garden Quickie, the show where in two minutes or less, we keep you constantly busy. And today's episode is all about summer work. More specifically, tasks we need to do during the summer months to maximize our garden's potential. I got five of them today, time short as always, so let's get into it. First up is weeding. Heat, light, moisture, food. Everything is optimal for our plants right now. Well, the weeds are enjoying it too. Take the time now to do another round of weeding to reduce crowding and competition for our crops. Don't let the weeds get any worse than they already are. Next, once all the weeding is done, Take note of any empty spaces you might now have. Maybe removing those weeds has created some space for you. Or, unfortunately, maybe some of the plants you transplanted didn't make it. Or on the positive side, maybe you've already harvested some of your crops. 
Either way, now is a great time to fill in some of those empty spots with some more plants to maximize your yield for the year. Just as those weeds and our plants proliferate, so do the pests. Right now is the time when outbreaks happen, so you'll need to be diligent and take action. Start with manual removal using your fingers or water and try to avoid harmful systemic chemicals that are bad for the soil and bad for you. In fact, if things like aphids are getting out of hand, check out the video link above for a DIY natural and safe insect spray. It really can make the difference. One of the biggest protectors for our soil and plants against excessive heat and drought in the summer is mulch. As an organic protective shield mitigating moisture loss and extreme temperatures, mulch is a must. Summer is a great time to reapply mulch to those bare spots and keep that barrier intact and working for you. And lastly, we have our fifth summer gardening task and that's the harvest. Yes, we obviously grow our veggies with the goal of a harvest, but now is also a great time to pick those constant producers so that they keep producing. Crops such as zucchinis, peas, peppers, and even tomatoes will often be stimulated to keep producing the more we pick. Fruiting takes energy, so if we can remove the fruit as it ripens, the plants are going to have more energy to put towards the next round of bounty. It's really amazing how that works. The more you pick, the more you get. And in turn, you'll have more energy to check out the next episode of the Garden Quickie. Thanks for watching guys. And hey, if Garden Quickies are your thing, be sure to click on this playlist here as we explore and solve more growing issues in two minutes or less.